Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. So, first of all, thanks to, to Mark and the organisers for the for the invite to to speak from the kitchen this morning. So, um, yeah, so th- th- what we want to look at really for the next few minutes is just the question around feed management uh, and its role in greenhouse gas abatement from, from ruminant systems. So uh, the, the, what I want to run through for, the, for this morning is, I suppose, is just a bit of background and context. Now, a lot of that, this has been covered already in the, in the earlier webinar, so I don't want to go too, too much into that. But the livestock industry, the numbers and trends, so, and what that will mean in terms of um, the, the challenge from, from, a, from a methane emissions point of view. Um, we want to look at where uh, methane abatement fits in the current, uh, in the current MAC or the, the abatement cost uh, curve. Um, so also after that, we just want to take a look then also at methane abatement in grazing systems and wh- where the current research is at. Um, from that point of view, and the potential role in particular of, of feed additives as an abatement strategy. Um, and finally, just to, to, to divide the two in terms of the, the methane as one issue, the nitrous oxide as a separate issue, we want to also take a look at what, um, uh, what can be done from, it, from a nitrous oxide point of view in grazing, in grazing systems. Okay. So, um, as we all know, and um, we've, re- we've all been reading these things, uh, it's media fodder at this stage in terms of what is happening inside the room and on its effect on, on greenhouse emissions. And it's, it's an established fact at this, at this stage. But there, there seems to be some class of, I don't know, some sort of class of scatological fascination with what cows are doing in terms of their, in terms of their gut and in terms of what it means for, 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 rumen, um, for rumen methane production. So as Mark outlined at the start, we're talking about close to 50% of our um, greenhouse gas emission is coming from, fr- from the rumen source. Okay, so obviously that's going to be linked to, to cattle numbers. And particularly over the last number of years, particularly with, with liberalization of milk policy, um, with quotas being abolished, there has been a change in, in cattle numbers. And as much a change as a, a shift in terms of the type of cattle in the country. So just to, but to put that in some degree of context, um, this is just a graph, and we'd have seen this. We'll have seen this previously, um, but it's just tracking cow numbers, basically, or cattle numbers in the country from 1980 up till sort of up, up to the recent years. So, really, what we can see there is that um, over that period of time, and there have been various incarnations of EU policy over this period, but there was certainly a slow and steady decline uh, from the mid 90s up to about 2010. And then in advance and since the abolition of milk quotas, cattle numbers have, have increased uh, steadily since. So obviously with methane, that's a lot of, that's a lot of extra rubens you could say in the country since 2011. But you can also see that we're pretty much back in terms of cattle numbers to where we were sometime around the mid, mid 1990s. So to- probably surprising to some people that total cattle numbers haven't increased beyond historical highs for sure, but still the trajectory is in a certain, in a certain direction. But what's also important to remember uh, within, that co- within that context is how the balance of different systems of production is changing. Now, this is important because uh, the, the, rate of, the, the rate of greenhouse gas emission and perhaps the, the rate of uptake of technologies may be different depending on the, system, uh, the sector. So what we're just showing here is the breakdown in those, um, in those numbers between dairy cows and other cows here being beef cows or, or suckler cows, I suppose. Uh, if we go back to 1980, um, uh, if we go back to 1980, we basically had 1.6 million dairy cows in the country, quite similar to what we have now. But at that time, we basically had about 75,000 dairy farmers milking on average 18 cows each. Uh, and we had about 400,000 beef cows in the country. And as you can see, as milk quotas that were introduced, as uh, policy changed, as there was direct payment for, uh, for, for coupled payment for sucklers, the cut, suckler cow numbers increased and have remained steady and maybe slightly, slightly declining since. So where are we at now? We're now in a situation where we've about 16 to 17,000 dairy farmers in the country milking close to 90 cows on average uh, with, with um, beef cow numbers per farm at about 14. So the reason that I suppose that's important is that from a from an extension point of view, and there was a lot of talk in some of the other webinars about the need for extension and knowledge transfer to be the key issue here that we need to drive ad- adoption at farm level. We have seen over the last number of years, I suppose, 
a professionalization, if that's, if that's a word, of the dairy sector in that we now have a smaller number of larger scale dairy farms, still a family farm structure very much so, still kind of an owner operator structure, uh, small in relative to some other areas uh, globally, but we, we, have a, we have a sort of a, a, a full-time dairy system and we have what could be characterized as somewhat a part-time, a lot of part-time farmers on the beef side, but with some strongly focused commercial beef farmers also. So it's a slightly different, uh, it's a different environment into which we're pushing our messages now. Uh, in terms of getting adoption of, of technology. So that's where, that's where we are at the moment, I suppose. And if you look what that has meant for greenhouse gas emissions over that time, you can see basically that emissions are tracking, are tracking stock numbers, dropping through the mid-2000s and creeping up, since, uh, creeping up since maybe 2013, 2014. And as you can see on the chart there, enteric fermentation being a significant part uh, of the overall budget, uh, close to 50%, uh, as was mentioned. Okay? Um, but that does that does beg the question. This this is a this is a, a real life question as to what um, how these numbers will evolve uh, over time. Now, uh, the, the the Chagas researchers in the, in the rural economy section have done quite a bit of work in terms of modelling out what the potential scenarios are. And this chart here is just looking at six different scenarios, which are basically a combination of uh, cattle beef cow numbers increasing and or beef cow numbers decreasing uh, and dairy cow numbers either static or increasing. So there's a there's a range of things going on there, but I suppose it's just you know it's it's we see how we'll see how that develops over time, uh, and obviously if we have situations where cattle numbers are increasing, if there's a pro rata increase without mitigation strategies, we obviously will have a, a large issue on the on the greenhouse gas side of things. So certainly the. The, the, the cattle numbers are one thing, but implementing the mitigation strategies across a broad base of, of, of farms is very, very important. I suppose I haven't mentioned sheep in this, uh, obviously the other significant sector with, with ruminants in it. Uh, I suppose it's sheep numbers been, been declining over recent years. We just decided to, to exclude them from the forward projections, but certainly it's not to ignore, um, it's not to ignore the sheep sector either. So look, that's where, that's where we're going. I suppose one thing to just, just to be clear on, um, we have to be clear on this that since the the rate of change since 2015, since quotas have have um, were abolished, has been you know it has been of a large magnitude. Uh, from my experience out on the ground and looking at talking to a lot of farmers, a lot of conferences, uh, a lot of people on the ground and looking at business planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in in the real world. Uh, Perhaps the rate of change in the next five to ten years won't be as large as it was. There was a lot of pent up, a lot of pent up uh, potential within the system up to 2015, and a very large correction, I suppose, in terms of what, where numbers are at. If perhaps uh, that heat that's there may or may not continue, but I think it would be slightly. We want to be cautious that we we take a straight line projection based on what has happened over the last five years, because certainly. Uh, Certainly, it was a new a new situation for a lot where a lot of farmers found them for the for themselves in they had scope to uh, increase their numbers for the first time in a long time, so we just need to be careful on how we interpret the forward numbers but anyway, look um that's where the numbers are at, but we also and anyone who's tuned into the previous uh, webinars that have seen uh, a lot of discussion on the mac or the the abatement uh, uh, cost uh, curve so all this is all the measures taken together and looking at what they can do from a, a cumulative reduction on greenhouse gas so you can see from zero up to up to two million tons essentially here okay so and these are the different measures and a lot of these have been covered previously in terms of fertilizer type dairy EBI, which is basically a, a genetic index for efficiency, uh, extended grazing, uh, nitrogen use efficiency, they're all in there. But interesting, and just something that, that might strike you when you look at where the, um, where the enteric fermentation of the methane production is such a large part of the, the overall budget, if you look here, the, in terms of direct dietary uh, solutions, they're actually, they, at the moment, they appear quite small. On the on the Mac, and there's a reason for that. We just want to go into that for a moment. It, it's um, you know all of these other issues have been verified, they have been looked at what they can do in, in terms of delivery. But I suppose from a dietary point of view, and a direct dietary intervention, uh, we we have work to do in terms of making that a, to, con, making that a larger contributor to the Mac overall. So we just want to take a couple of minutes to look at what's ha actually happening out there on that. So before we just get into some of the issues and and uh, look at what 
what direct research is out there at the moment. It is just worth remembering that, you know, why are we bothering with this at all, I suppose? And why not just say, well, ruminants are ruminants and they're causing problems. So why would we, why would we persist with it? It is, it is important to remember the fundamental uh, reason for ruminant systems and why they're so intrinsically linked to, to I suppose, human development, societal development over, over millennia. The, the simple fact is that ruminants do convert indigestible plant fiber, so cellulose essentially, into high quality food for, for human consumption. So in terms of a spectrum of, uh, in terms of spectrum, spectrum of carbohydrate and lignin fractions, if you go from very simple sugar up to timber, they're all carbon fractions. Uh, obviously very digestible as sugar to totally indigestible as timber, but you come back somewhere in the middle, uh, the, the human uh, digestive system runs out of road, that, whereas the ruminant system can also incorporate cellulose, hemicellulose, and digest those. So essentially what the rumen does is it converts, um, it converts indigestible cell wall material into high quality product and has, done, has been very useful for human development over the millennia. So the trick is, can we, and that's where the research is looking at now, can we um, change or modify what happens in the room in, in order to allow this to continue while also um, mitigating the, 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 the byproduct of that, which is, which is the methane essentially. So if we just look here for two seconds and just to see what the, what the actual issue is, the issue is basically, uh, this is just a, a, very simple, uh, a very simple diagram of a room. And so effect effectively, as the animal eats carbohydrate and protein, uh, it's the bugs or the, the, the rumen microbes that break down that, that cellulose and hemicellulose. Okay? They break that into, into usable product for the animal. So it's really the rumen bacteria that create the, um, the useful products from this otherwise indigestible material. But a byproduct of that and this, a byproduct of that process is methane production. So effectively, the animal needs to get rid of, needs to get rid of hydrogen. So what does methane do? It gives them an efficient, an efficient means of, of excreting or, or of getting rid of that additional hydrogen from the, from the room. So while we have all this good stuff down here, of quality product that the animal can utilize, there is also this byproduct. And that's the issue that we need to really be focusing on. So look, management factors, and there's been a huge amount of work done on this over the years, management factors will affect the balance of end product between you know, the, 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 the methane versus the useful product. So for example, very high fiber, too high in fiber forages, very stemmy forages would probably increase your methane production you know, more carbohydrate, more rapidly fermentable carbohydrate would probably reduce it. Certain oils will, 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 will reduce it also. Animal type and production level will change it. So an animal that's perhaps highly productive animal with a high level of intake will produce more, will produce more um, methane, but at the same time will produce more product as well. So there's a balance between footprint and also total amount of, of methane produced. So I suppose those those, those issues are all being looked at and have been looked at over the years. And essentially, the more, pr the more productive days an animal has and the better the quality of the diet overall in terms of digestibility, and uh, particularly on digestibility, the lower the relative production of, um, of methane is. However, what I suppose where the, the research has gone to now is to try and look at can we use specific feed additives, which would be added in a sort of grams per day level, is there things there that could actually affect the supply of this methane or affect the, affect the end product of methane? So effectively, direct some of that energy that's now used as a, to produce a byproduct, direct some of that energy in a different direction uh, for more productive use. So, you know, you've probably all seen these photographs at some stage of uh, animals with, with packs on their, on their back. So this is just... Um, this is just a, a, basically a, a measurement system, the SF6 system, measuring wh what the methane output is uh, from, from, from Belgian cows, essentially. So there's a lot of work done over the years where perhaps animals would graze different diets or graze different types of swords, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and measure what the methane, it's just a methane measurement system. There's also in place at the moment in Moor Park, the green feed system through the Vista Mill project, where again, it's a feed station set up in the paddock and it's dispensing some of these additives in, in, in pellet form and then measuring as the animals eat those it measures um it, it also measures what is um what the, what the methane out, output is so it's essentially a tower to capture capture the, the the emissions okay so where's where's that at, at the moment there's a range of these products being looked at at the moment and as i say there's been plenty of research done in the past on them the, the, the overall message, I suppose, is given, given how intrinsic the methane production is from a, from a rumen point of view, uh, the, at, so far it has proven 
quite difficult actually to shift methane production in the long term. There has been no silver bullet to date. Uh, it's often seen that perhaps uh, animal production might be, or animal performance might be reduced depending on what it does to intake some of these products. The benefits might be short lived. So the rumen has a, uh, has a capacity to correct itself in terms of its rumen population or its microbial population. The methane reduction levels can be variable depending on the type of animal, the type of diet. Um, it, it certainly does depend on the diet. And to date, there has been relatively little work done with pasture-based systems. So I suppose that's where the, the research effort from a Chagas point of view is now looking at. We're looking at cer certain products that are showing promise. For example, the Mutral products, um, 3NOP would be another product that's perhaps, uh, perhaps useful. So the issue here is really, and that's where we're at at the moment, is testing a range of products, seeing that they actually, can we verify a reduction in a in a grazing situation and that is important it's very it's not valid to just take some in vitro stuff or take stuff done on different diets and take a straightforward um a straightforward um translation of benefit into a grass system they have to be tested and verified in the grass system so these things these additives are being tested at the moment to see what what can what can what can be done so if something shows promise and it can get credit within the inventory. It can be that therefore then it, at that point, then it can make a greater contribution to the Mac overall. So just to give it an indication maybe of what the scale of difference could be, for example, some of those products have shown in and around the 15 to 25% reduction in methane, maybe let's take 20%. So a 20% reduction in methane, if that was used, were used across 30% of the national herd, it could reduce your methane emissions by about, about a million tons. So there's a, there's a big win there if it can be done. But there are, as I say, there are issues in terms of delivery of the product, verification of the product, and seeing what, you know, are they valid long term in a, in a grazing situation. So just as an example, and this is taken, this is taken work on the 3NOP product, which is, um, which is essentially a, a synthetically based, a synthetically developed product, which is what it, what it does is, in essence, what it does is it knocks out the final step of methane production. So it, it ties up the, the final enzyme involved in methane production, which reduces methane production in the rumen overall. And you can see there, based on a control diet in, in red versus three levels of feeding of the three NOP product, a significant uh, reduction in methane production over a 12 to 14 week period, which is significant. It's longer perhaps than what some of the other things like condensed tannins, et cetera, would have, would have delivered in the past. So there's the essential point here, without getting into too much detail, is that there are products being tested at the moment. There are some products showing uh, potential benefit. Uh, the, the benefits are maybe more longer lived than some of the previous incarnations. But we need we need to be testing a range of these, and that is that work is ongoing. So something like that, this type of issue would be where we where, where we're looking at from a from a direct having a direct effect at the, at the um, at the rumen level. So I suppose, look, um, not to kill you too much with, with data, but just to, to pull in here, based on that similar diet, one of the most important things, I suppose, also is that, that there is no negative effect to the animal's health, the animal's welfare, or, or the animal's productivity. If we want these things to be, um, to be adopted at farm level, we can't it will be obviously be more difficult if there's a if there's a if there's a yield or a productivity penalty. But in in these situations, or when we've looked at these, the control versus the the levels of of dosage that would give a beneficial effect for this product, at least the um, the yield effect is 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 minimal. So there's while we're reducing methane production, we're also holding on to the to to the to productivity. Well, so look, um, we're not saying that this, this is a silver bullet, but it's just to give a flavor and idea of the type of work that is being done. And there will be more, there will be more of these to be, to be looked at. So look, just to, to, to put the issues on the table, um, verification of long-term effect is obviously the thing we need to be doing in a pasture system. We need to be working out the inclusion rates and the delivery. Um, there's different effects in different animal types that has to be accounted for. There's also the issue of cost and, the, you know, is it scalable? Is, the, are the, is, it, is it feasible to be manufacturing a product that's included in grams per day? Um, is it feasible to, to, um, to produce that at a sufficient scale that can dilute the methane emissions across millions of cattle? That's a, that's a real question. So it's okay doing it at, at trial scale, but it has to be scalable to, for really to have an impact, an impact on the industry. We also have to be careful on the production and the animal health effects, obviously on 
the, the residues and the toxicity of these, of these issues as well. So there, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work to be done there. But as I do say, that given the, the, the changes in technology and particularly in the ability to characterize rumen populations now, the, the, you know, the high throughput genetic uh, capabilities now, I think researchers are getting better at find, at getting they're getting better at getting closer to the answer every time. So that's a that that is positive. Just finally, Mark, just not to kill us too much on time, but just to, to separate the methane from the maybe from the nitrous oxide, which is obviously the other significant greenhouse gas. Uh, just to give a flavour of some of the issues that are that are occurring there, some of the work being done. John Finn's group in in. Um, in Johnston Castle in, in County Wexford is working, has worked a lot over the years on uh, multi-species swords, so diverse swords including clovers, plantain, chicory, uh, along with your ryegrass and maybe some, some timothy as well. So a diverse pasture rather than a simple uh, monoculture ryegrass. So the idea around this would be certainly from a, from a drought resistance point of view, from a reduction in fertilizer nitrogen. So synthetic fertilizer nitrogen can be reduced due to the nitrogen fixing capabilities of these swords. But there's also some interesting work being done in, in, in Ireland and elsewhere on the potential for these animals to, or these swords, to reduce the um, nitrous oxide losses from, from urine patches. So there are secondary compounds, in particularly in the plantain, possibly some effects at the root level as well, that, um, that show some potential in terms of reducing the nitrous oxide losses uh, in, a, in a grazing system. So uh, we, have, we have cattle grazing these and cows grazing these at the moment. We're looking at how they perform in terms of, a, will they perform on the ground at field scale for, for, for production systems? Um, and can they have a beneficial effects in terms of, you know, mitigating the, the need for for synthetic nitrogen and also maybe having an, a direct effect at the, at the level of reduced nitrous oxide losses. So interesting work being done by, by John and his, and his group there. Uh, and also another piece of work done in, uh, in Johnston also on uh, nitrous oxide and it's the rate of excretion uh, of nitrous oxide on, on pasture. So this is some Dominica Kral's work looking at how uh, how nitrous oxide emission can change between the different fractions across the season and due to different soil types. So uh, effectively what, what Dominique and her group have done there is looked at where the emission, what, what is the standard uh, assumption on the emission factor within, within, our, within our inventory. Um, our, our, our standard is two, uh, that would be our emission factor, but Dominique has been looking and showing over a couple of seasons that maybe um, in certainly in spring and summer, uh, the, the, the emissions from, of nitrous oxide in grazing systems from, from urine patches might be less than, than the two for a significant portion of the season. Obviously, you can see there that urinary N in, in wet soils in the autumn might be an issue, but across the season, there's promise there to say that there may be, there may be potential to look at, to, to, to narrow down the definitions in terms of what nitrous oxide is truly being emitted from, from those types of situations. Quickly on, um, on nitrogen, I know we've talked a lot there about nitrous oxide and also on uh, methane as well, but just to, to make the point in terms of when we talk about grass-based systems, you know, whether it's from an ammonia point of view, nitrous oxide point of view, or it's from a, a, a methane point of view, it, it is important to remember that in a pasture system that we really want to keep, uh, we want to keep that as the central part of our livestock production systems. Chemical composition of pasture does change a lot over the growth pattern and over through the season as well. So it can be from a very high protein feed, high nitrogen feed, uh, low fiber feed to a very high fiber, low protein feed, depending on the stage at which it's grazed. So that can have a major effect in terms of you know what the, what the uh, what the what the what's excreted from the animal based on what it's eaten. So grass is not just simply grass; uh, it stays green, but it changes a lot in terms of its um, its composition. So there has been a huge um, a huge KT effort, a huge knowledge transfer effort over the last uh, 10, 20 years at this stage to try to move farmers to a position where they will utilize their pasture, that they will capture as much of the energy and protein as possible, uh, which involves correct fertilizer, grazing at the right stage and grazing at the appropriate stocking rate. So there's a lot of moving parts. Grazing systems are not all created equal. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of trying to hit the balance that, 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 that gives us the maximum efficiencies. Okay, I might go into too much detail in this, but it's just, just to give a, a, a point that, you know, when we're talking about managing protein content in grass, for example, 
So if we graze grass too early and apply too much fertilizer, we'll have a very high soluble nitrogen fraction, which will be excreted essentially, which is a waste to the system to the animal. If it's grazed too late, our fibre increases too much, uh, which probably leads to higher uh, methane emission potential. So grazing management is a, is a key thing. Uh, it drives the profitability of the system, but it also can have an effect on the emissions. Uh, and in general speaking, in, in a grass-based system, which is a positive from, from a national point of view, generally speaking, we are it's a good feed to put protein into the system and put energy into the system. We don't really need, in, the, in most grazing situations, we don't need to be feeding certainly expensive and definitely expensive imported protein sources are probably not needed. Perhaps a little energy supplementation for the certain times of the year. Our winter forages tend to be too low in quality, too low in protein, too low in energy. There's a big campaign needed there in terms of to improve management, to, to improve productivity over the when grass is not available in Irish pasture systems. Um, and I suppose as a from an extension point of view too also, what we sort of have to do also, I think from a feeding point of view, is we do need to break this assumed link between protein and quality. I think often for years, farmers in, in this country and trade as also and even advisory, they, we always assume that protein and protein equals quality. Protein equals nitrogen. Animals need nitrogen and energy. So it's it's not as simple as just pushing for additional protein. We need to we need to look more at balancing our diets within a within a, a pasture system. And there's certainly no point in adding additional protein on top of what already is a system that has plenty of protein in, and plenty of degradable protein al already available. So look, just to summarize, and hopefully you haven't gone crazy over time. Uh, to summarize, look, methane production remains the key challenge. Um, high performance animals and diets, they do reduce the footprint per kilo of product, but perhaps the, the, overall, the overall kilos of, of CO2 may increase. So it's a question of balancing the absolutes versus the, the, the footprint, essentially. Um, I suppose the rumen-based mitigation to address the absolute emission levels is needed, uh, and there's a lot of work ongoing on that. Um, so far, no silver bullet. Uh, the, the, the utility of these things at a large scale has been limited by the persistence of the effects. So short-term methane drop followed by a correction in the rumen that has limited the that has limited the utility. But as I say, newer technologies are being looked at all the time. They're showing promise. Whether that's um, the garlic and seaweed-based products, the synthetic products of tree NOP, and we've all heard the story on seaweed also. So there are certain compounds there that have been tested and shown shown promise. Uh, from a nitrous oxide point of view on pasture, there is evidence that there are variable emissions due to soil, weather, and nitrogen conditions. So uh, the straightforward average might be higher in, in the straightforward average that's assumed might be too high relative to what's happening on the ground. Um, there are some evidence that specific nutrients in, in certain pasture diets can shift fraction, nitrogen fractions away from urinary, urine nitrogen, which is where the risk of of emissions comes from more maybe to, to more fecal end uh, or so there's a there's a there's a possible shift there depending on on on, on pasture type and quality so there's, there's some potential there and like all these things and in conclusion there is a there is a certain there's a huge extension effort needed across all of this stuff mark to improve certainly produce the quality of pasture uh, and conserve forage we need to shift our thinking on crude protein in, in pasture based diets and certainly um, we, we, we also need to just exercise a bit of caution when you know there are hundred you know there are dozens of different options being touted around around specific inclusions of ingredients for mitigation you know we, we have to make sure that there's verification before application at, at, at industry level okay um, I'll just leave you like that thanks hey Joe thanks very much for that really excellent uh, comprehensive presentation and uh, you didn't uh, bamboozle us too much, I think. You explained the, the technology side of things very well. Um, uh, Joe, um, we'll just get your, your, um, your, your, your camera turned on there now. Uh, now, we're also joined uh, by uh, Pat Murphy. Uh, Pat Murphy is uh, head of the Environment Knowledge Transfer Program in Chagas, and uh, Pat has kindly uh, offered to help us out with some of the questions because what we found with these webinars is that we were getting really a uh, huge engagement from from across the, bo the board so uh, today we have over 200 participants on our webinar so we're delighted uh, that the, the level of interest in our webinars so Pat how are you today great good 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 surviving 
surviving the, the lockdown. Um, Joe, uh, if we can ask you to switch back on your, uh, your, your camera as well so that we can, we can uh, take a look at the... I think you've stopped it, Mark, have you? Yeah, we can just uh, switch it on yeah. there. Then, That's great. Right. Perfect. Brilliant. So, Joe, uh, just to kick things off, um, I suppose I have a question for you is that, you know, if the dairy herd expands further, mm. will the rate of CO2 per kg not also increase due to uh, more intensive fertilizer and feeding? Or, you know, has this been accounted for in the projections? So not just based on the absolutes, Mark, per, yeah, so... Oh, so will the rate per cow increase also rather than just the number of cows? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Okay. So will the rate of CO2 per kilogram of product or per kilogram of milk not also increase? Yeah, it, it is possible. I suppose it depends on if, if you want to look at this and there's some Don O'Brien had a good work done on that over the last number of years, looking at a full life cycle analysis of, um, of greenhouse gases from dairy systems, looking at, you know, intensive concentrate based systems where there's a lot of cropping going on maybe a lot of fossil fuels burned to to move feed because to move feed in and out of the system and maybe more intensive fertilizer on a given area of land certainly there there is there is a there is a risk there that the rate of emissions per head could increase so that's really why you know that's really why if you if you if you look from where the chagas roadmap for dairy and has talked about over the last number of years there such a thing as an optimum stocking rate. We don't, we've never advocated for very intensive uh, stocking rates. Be, what I mean by intensive, I mean we, we've never advocated for people to stock their farms beyond the capacity of the farm to produce pasture to feed their stock, if you know what I'm saying. Now that gets lost a little bit in terms of the, in terms of the, the expansion story, but our model would always be try and retain the self-sufficiency for feed within the farm, right? Mm -hmm. By doing that, we can hold the, the rate of emissions per head. We would guard a lot against pushing towards systems that are reliant on imported feed, reliant on fossil fuel, reliant on you know, farming off concrete, essentially. That has its own issues with, with ammonia as well as with greenhouse gas emissions. So I suppose that really depends on what way the industry wants to develop itself like each individual dairy farmer has their own decisions to make and it's not our job to tell them what they can and can't do within their own yard but our um our uh, advice has always been keep the keep the self-sufficiency part big there um the profitability of the marginal milk and the profitability of pushing the very intensive systems is questionable anyway mm -hmm. so it may not be in the farmer's best interest in the first place to go it's very intensive systems. So okay. there's a lot of reasons that are, there's a lot of reasons other than the, than the environmental, a lot of economic reasons why you wouldn't go down that route. Uh, so I would say, yes, there's a risk that the greenhouse gas emissions per head would increase, but we would not be advocating that type of system in the first place. Okay, Pat, have you uh, some questions? Yeah, I suppose a, 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 a number of questions relating to the amount of research that's going on in, in, in relation to, and the type of research in relation uh, to the products that are showing some uh, potential. What's needed in that research uh, to, to bring it to a possible uh, market uh, place? Yeah. Yeah, look, um, this has been going on for research into specific ingredients has been for a long time uh, you know it's all freely available and anyone can get out there and, and read what's there there's different pro like look you can start from things like condensed tannins for example specific fat inclusion oil inclusions fat inclusions um there was antibiotics tried for a while to try and knock out it's the methane producing microbes that people are trying to knock out essentially right so there's a lot of that has happened over the years what i suppose pat is that um it's, time, it's costly and exp it is t costly in terms of time and money to, to investigate every single potential additive that's out there, if you know what I'm saying. It's kind of me too type of stuff, you know, well, here's another one, here's another one. You know, it's X, Y, Z, A, B, C, which one are we going to test next? So what has happened in the last number of years, I suppose, is that the, the, particularly from a, from a microbial genetics point of view, now I'm not on this, but from talking to some people on, on, on that side of the house, there is a better capacity now to identify more closely identify 
additives or molecules that have to have a real a real chance of actually having an effect. So the three NOP model for, or molecule, for example, would be something like that. There's a nice bit of work done on that. Um, so what has to happen? You have to basically use that additive in a in a in a setting mirrors as best as possible mirrors where it's going to be used commercially. So there is no point in, for example, Ireland sort of trying to import a, a piece of research done on a TMR system, on a different type of forage, with a different type of animal, and just t make straight line assumptions of what that's gonna do here. We have to test it in a pasture system at the level of feeding and the type of diet we're feeding, because there is a difference between how these things can, can work depending on the base diet that they've been used in. So at the moment, through the, the Vista Mill project in, in Moorpark, being led up by Lawrence Shaluda in there, um, there is that green feed system is in place and they're testing a series of these these things some of them are showing promise um, it's too early to say much too much about them uh, but they're showing promise in the way that other i suppose how would i say they're they're, they're they're the ones that have been selected for use based on other systems they, they're showing it's good promise that in the range of that sort of 15 20 percent reduction but it's we don't want to be saying too much about this until it's verified over time I suppose that's the that's the key point. So look, in a in a one final thing, maybe Pat, just to, to explain maybe why pasture diets are different. Uh, the first thing is that you know, in dairy cows in Ireland spend their time outside eating eating grass basically. They get supplemented maybe twice a day when they get for milking at very small levels. So there's only two opportunities per day to deliver that feed. Whereas in a in an indoor situation, they may be eating that additive all day so that's one challenge and the second challenge is that Ireland's diets are are forage based it's not starch in it so there could be slight differences there so look I think I think it's a wait and see thing and it's the reason as we said at the start it's the reason why it doesn't appear heavily on the Mac at the, at the moment but if something comes true on those things certainly it has a real potential to to shift the, it has real potential to shift in addition to everything else on the Mac it's not that this is going to replace the other measures it's going to add to them I suppose I, I suppose a, a kind of a follow on to that is is uh, what a uh, question. What do you think that uh, the acceptability to both industry and consumer of adding chemical or chemicals or other substances uh, will be? Uh, I suppose given what's happened in, uh, I suppose particularly in relation yeah. to the protected urea. I suppose I'm just after um, drink, taking a drink of a chemical. It's a chemical called water. Uh, <laughs> so. Everything is a chemical at some level, you know. Uh, so I suppose take take some of the some of the products, for example. Um, for example, the Mutrel product. A lot of that that's based on the garlic extract and citrus extract. Okay. Um, the three NOP product is a synthetic product, which has its toxicity. You know, th that's one of the things that has to be done. The three NOP product has been tested for its um, the risk of. Its toxicity risk is being assessed also. So all these things have to be the first, for sure. There have been some issues with, with other additives in, others, in, others, in, in fertilizer, for example, on the urea side of things, not what we're using ourselves, but in, in a different context, in a different, in a different jurisdiction. And those things have to be tested out. So for sure, um, we're not going to start running around adding so chemicals into, into feed uh, willy-nilly. They're going to be essentially organic products that have the capacity to change something within the rumen and, and they have to be verified in terms of what they, what they mean from toxicity. That's, the, that's why it takes a long time to prove any of these things because the whole suite from what, it ha what happens in the room to what happens in the, in the end product has to, be, has to be verified. So, but you know, we, we have to just be a little bit careful. We're not talking about sort of fancy chemicals here. We're talking about a lot of these things are organic extracts in the, in the first place. So we're in the interest of time now, we're, we're a little bit against the clock. So what we'll try and do is uh, do a, a rapid fire round if we can at all possible, because we want to try and address as many questions as possible. Okay. Um, so a uh, quick question here, Joe, what is the optimum grazing time to manage protein content? The optimum time to manage grazing protein content is when the plant has three leaves. Um, so 1400, for people who are measuring grass, about 1,400 covers. Uh, usually about 20, in the mid-season, in the summertime, probably between 20, 20 days, roughly, three weeks after uh, it had been grazed previously. That's the optimal balance between protein and energy. Okay? Uh, too early and you have too much protein relative to energy, too late and you have too much fiber. So three weeks after it has been grazed previously. 
Okay. Um, the next question here is in relation to the, the, the you mentioned multi-species grassland in your presentation in, in the context of nitrous oxide, but uh, are there benefits from a methane uh, reduction perspective? I know obviously uh, these multi-species grassland, they, they provide a more resilient sward and there's drought proofing and so on, but on yeah. the methane, direct methane side of things, is it? Is there any research to support that? I suppose we haven't done much on that. We haven't done much on it yet. Um, it's probably something that will happen over time. Um, I suppose the bigger focus for the multi-species was, as you said, Mark, drought resistance, um, I suppose, reduction of chemical N, potentially more so on the side of the nitrous oxide, to be fair, in terms of how it changes the, the utilization of nitrogen within the animal itself. Some evidence that the, the plantain, I think, in particular, can have can change at, at the, at, within the soil itself can change how nitrous oxide is 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 utilized from a methane point of view uh, i'm not so sure on that just yet now to be honest question here um in relation to um, seaweed or uh, red mm -hmm. macroalgae um as a feed ingredient they claim significant reductions in methane and increased weight gain is this approach really feasible and any toxicity issues. You kind of touched on that earlier yeah, on. Because again, look, the, you have to just, it's, it's a specific compound within the red marine algae for sure. Um, and when you look at the, effectively what that's doing is it's knocking out the, um, it's knocking out the, the microbes in the room and that produce the, the methane in the first place. Uh, the issues with that will be, I suppose, uh, is it scalable? Can it, be in, can it be produced in enough quantity that it can get into the room of enough animals over time? Uh, and again, it needs to be tested in a pasture set and tested over a long period of time. There is no point in feeding any of these products for four weeks, five weeks, and saying, yes, that had, had a big effect, and assuming that that effect will exist or last in, into the future. Because any of the probial populations in the room and they have the capacity to correct themselves, recorrect themselves over time. So that is the issue. We need to we need to test them in real world situations. And I think this is what the issue is going to be for the next while is we're going to have it's going to be seaweed this week. It could be something else next week. And every, all these products will, will come forward. Uh, we have to be testing them rigorously uh, in our own in our own context before we can really make any pronouncements on them. Joe, there's a, a, a question here about uh, the uh, stumbling blocks in relation to lowering the protein content uh, of yeah. uh, dairy feeds. Uh, and I suppose that the tenure of the question is, is that uh, uh, I suppose we've had uh, a long period where we're using relatively high protein diets right mm -hmm. throughout the year. Is the stumbling block getting farmers order uh, uh, lower uh, protein content yeah. or is the stumbling block getting the industry to supply it? Well, there are always three questions when you order nuts, uh, Pat, as you know, you know, what's the price of it? What's the protein of it? And can you deliver it before the weekend? That's the three things that people want to know. Uh, the middle question to me is sort of irrelevant, what the protein level is. Uh, always look, from a, historically, protein has to appear on the label. It's a legal requirement to appear on the label. So there is a, an assumption that protein equals quality. Uh, you can have very high protein, poor quality rations, and you can have very high protein, uh, high quality rations. So look, I think there is more and more, I think, particularly on dairy farms, more and more dairy farms have copped on to the point that it's energy content and quality ingredients that has a bigger effect than the protein percent. But protein is used as a shorthand for quality. And I think until that stops, we're still going to get people that think 18% is better than 14%. In a grazing situation, for the last number of years, 14% crude protein across the mid-season is more than adequate. We've done quite a bit of work in Johnstown on winter milk systems, which would be requiring a lot of supplementary protein over the winter period. We have dropped the overall protein in the diet down to 15% rather than 17% or 18%. In the total diet now, down to about fifteen percent, with no difference in product, with productivity at all. So, there, there's there's very good nutritional models out there now that can allow us to balance our diets at lower protein levels, and we should be taking we should be making use of them. Joe, you know, there's um, a question here in relation so, to some department funded work uh, being carried out by Sinead Waters uh, on additives. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? 
with, with Sinead. I think with Sinead's work, um, I need to dig a little bit more into Sinead's work, but I think Sinead's work in particular is looking at really focusing on, you know, the metabolome. We're looking at the, looking at the, spe the specific effects at a at a microbe level, Mark. So, characterize the changes in the microbe population. I suppose. Look, some of the time, this was this was always the problem with a lot of this stuff, where it was it was crude science in a way that we fed it and we measured the methane and we see what happens at the level of the output of the animal, essentially measuring the, measuring the output from the animal. Sinead's work uh, is more to look at the steps, the intermediate steps that actually make that happen, I suppose. So looking at what is the, what changes in terms of the, the metabolites produced, what the room, how the room and micro population changes over time. Is that stable? Is that fixed? Uh, so it's the capacity to characterize, I suppose, microbial genetics and look at the populations in more detail. That's where the real novelty, I suppose, comes through his work. So I suppose it, it will, in time, it will allow us to get more specific answers and get a better, I don't mean this flippantly, but it'll allow us to make a better guess as to which products will work over time, I suppose. So it's it's much more detailed that it's working at a, at a at a sort of a room and micro population level, which is a great place to be at. We're getting quite a lot of questions, Joe, about the cost benefit, um, particularly uh, on the benefit side. You know how how can we actually verify uh, the impact of these uh, additives on ultimately uh, greenhouse gas accounting? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the cost to the industry and uh, and ultimately yeah. to the farmer and to I suppose the end consumer. Sure. Well, first thing on in terms of the cost to the farmer, what does methane actually do? Methane is a is methane is a gas that allows um, effectively it allows end product of digestion to escape the rumen in the short. It, 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 so, if the additive can alter the fermentation in a way. That allows the animal to hold on to that energy. Hmm. There, there may be potential production effects. So you're switching fermentation that has a larger amount of byproduct, which is basically, it's like the idea of smoking up the chimney, Mark. Really, hmm. if we can hold on to, if we can hold on to retain more of that energy within the animal system, it has to go somewhere. So that's going to go to weight gain, or it's going to go to go into saleable product and some. So really, what we're trying to do is stop smoking up the chimney, effectively. From a, a cost point of view, again. This will be, we're talking about additives here that would be fed in grams per head per day. So it would be an additive, specific additive into, that has to fit neatly into the current production system. Otherwise, I think the uptake will be small. Um, the cost to the farmer, I suppose, you know, if we're looking at carbon credit and we're looking at what, what the cost of, of, of carbon ceilings are, if we can add something small into the diet to kind of significant effect at the and I think what I mean by significant is at the sort of 20% level that's a huge difference in terms of what our overall carbon output from from pasture based ruminant systems is so there's a clear a clear win there for the industry overall uh, the verification step I suppose and the I suppose I have been asked me that before are the, are the people who stand to gain most from this are they're the people who are doing the testing but look if if um, we certainly haven't run away with ourselves with any of the products in the past. There's been so many products um, tested previously and we haven't been jumping up and down shouting about any of them so far. So uh, the steps will be, as again, test it, uh, peer review, publish it, test it again, and then it's going to have to go through all of the licensing and all of the verification steps that any of that in any industry that any step has to take so it's not this is not um it's certainly not easy to get this thing done and once that's done and once it's verifiable and we have a certain emission factor uh, established for it then we can start looking a bit including it and get credit for it in the inventory okay so it's a rigorous testing procedure it's not something that we're just going to feed some seaweed for a few think that uh, that that's methane sort it's certainly not the case certainly not the case out of you, if you. Uh, yeah, there's a, a question. How helpful or unhelpful is measuring milk urea nitrogen uh, in grass-based systems as a as an indicator of of uh, protein levels in diet? Milk urea levels. Uh, there is a there is a straight there is pretty much a straight line relationship between milk urea and 
and protein con as in nitrogen or protein crude, crude protein content percent in the diet. Urea, effectively, milk is a is a is a means for animals to excrete surplus surplus nitrogen also rather than just urinary end. So certainly, milk, urea, nitrogen does help measure. The question, I suppose, Pat, is then can what affects that or what can animals retain an acceptable level of milk, urea, nitrogen in a pasture system? And certainly. Grazing, grazing situations and grazing stock, there is a sort of an adaptation to, 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 to the diet in terms of urea. I think we've seen a lot of herds where, and over a lot of years, where milk urea get quite, become quite stable on a pasture system and within the acceptable ranges. Look, I think where a lot of issues occur with milk urea is perhaps like 2018, for example, in, after a drought, where there was perhaps excess um, nitrogen applied uh, during dry conditions and then when we get rain we have a sudden uptake of nitrate into the plant certainly we'll see spikes in milk urea uh, in, the, in those situations so milk urea will pick that up and will demonstrate you know probably surplus to requirement fertilizer application so it does reflect the crude protein in the diet but in in, in a large number of cases milk urea levels become quite stable and quite quite fixed um they can become quite stable and quite acceptable within the normal ranges across a grazing season. So a useful enough tool, but we just want to be careful not to over-interpret the data on it as well. We have a question which, which kind of indicates we're, we're going beyond our expected scope of where, where we, we mm -hmm. were being listened to. Uh, how effective uh, is the use of in vitro studies for the determination of CH4 and other greenhouse gases especially here in Nigeria, where we uh, don't have more equipment to measure these gases. Uh, a quick comment. The in vitro, absolutely. And it's a big part of the system here uh, would be the in vitro as a screening, as a screening um, mechanism. I suppose if we want to look at in vitro, we, we, we screen a large number of product, products through the in vitro system. But then when it comes to verification of those early promising results, we do then move to the animal model. So that would be the answer. So certainly in vitro is a great way to get started in terms of narrowing down the potential uh, compounds that you want to look at and then scale it up then based on the best, the, the best options based on your in vitro results. So for sure, yeah, absolutely. I suppose, Mark, we have a few questions around other technologies and uh, maybe just a, a comment rather than a question for Joe. That <coughs> as the series goes on, we will be looking at an awful lot of the technologies uh, uh, have capability to, to reduce mitigation. So things like sequestration, uh, land management, forestry, all of those are coming up in, in the series. So any of you who have asked questions about that, we will be addressing them on, uh, um, on an ongoing basis. But I suppose we keep the questions here to the specific topic. Yeah, we seem to have quite a few questions around uh, the three NOP um, and asking about Irish trials and, and the timelines as to when you might see them on the market and potentially uh, adding them to the inventory for me yeah yes yeah. Joe, yeah. okay so yeah look again um i showed you the green feed system there that's in place in more at the moment um measurement kit is expensive uh it's not, we it is an expensive process to 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 look at these across across the season um we have, there are compounds in trial at the moment. There's a large scale study going on in that in Moor Park at the moment. I would say, look, Mark, I would say within the next, certainly within the next two to three years, we will have covered a lot of those products over time, you know? So it's, um, again, we're limited by, somewhat limited by the scale of, um, the scale of what, how many products you can test per year, et cetera, et cetera, which is always the issue with research. But I think there will be a lot, of new results from pasture systems available certainly in the in the in the next two to three year timeline i would think we would see a lot of those having covered i would i would think so look i don't want to i don't want to 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 do the old thing of sort of talk too much about results before the trial has even got halfway to be completed so all i can really say at the moment is that that work is definitely ongoing there are products on the ground or some products have been tested last year and i think a lot of the data on that will be certainly over the next 36 months. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Pat, any burning questions there from your end before we wrap things up? No, I think a, a comment there that uh, 
uh, Joe talked about the carbon intensity and the the the, um, uh, the absolute emissions. Uh, and uh, I suppose what you have there, uh, a comment from from one of our researchers, is that that are uh, that the carbon footprint is steadily uh, moving down, but to date has been overshadowed by the the increase in in absolute emissions due to to uh, some increases, particularly in dairy cows. And the, the trick is to speed one up and slow the other down. Mm. Oh, fair comment, right? Yeah. That's that's fair enough. Okay, Joe, uh, we're coming up to half past 10. I want to thank you very much for the time and effort that you put into your presentation today and, and the questions. Uh, uh, there are a lot more questions there that unfortunately we don't have time for um, because we want to keep confine our, our webinars to within the hour. So uh, what we might do at a later stage is try and pull together some of those questions and provide a response uh, uh, through our website or indeed maybe through a future webinar. Sure you're open to that. Um, Very good. So I just want to say thank you uh, for tuning in today. Uh, I want to thank Pat Murphy for helping us out with the questions and also in, in developing this program along with Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher. Um, I also want to remind you that this uh, will be recorded and uh, is uh, will be available on the Chagas YouTube channel uh, hopefully later on this afternoon. Um, if you're interested in, uh, if you want to stay in touch with Chagask, and uh, you can tune into uh, the Chagask Connected Digital Program, uh, if you go to chagask.ie forward slash connected, uh, you can receive uh, monthly updates on latest developments in Ch what's going on in Chagask and upcoming training as well uh, through uh, the Chagask Connected Program. So, with that, I'd like to thank you again for your attention. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost Series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost Series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.